just just because we just don't want to 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 you know uh, put, yeah, put I mean, that type yeah. of pressure on us and and certainly put anyone in a position where where they thought they were going on a great trip and now all of a sudden you know we're quarantining for two weeks uh in belize at our expense um or uh or you know having issues with getting back into the states all right with that um you know take that information in and kind of mold over um, if you have any questions as usual please just just email us or certainly ask it in the chat right now um, and we'll try and address it in the meantime we'll uh we'll start our video as a lot of people requested we're just going to do our um fish id and uh all right ethan what's up yeah i just uh i just want to just real quickly piggyback that being said, we, uh, you know, what we just said about Belize, yeah, the logistics we do have to worry about. But I, but at this point, September and beyond, you know, all the rest of the trips coming up uh, in the at the end of 2021 and beyond are good to go. So if, um, you know, at that point, uh, the logistics uh, plus, you know, the, the vaccinations and all that should have been smoothed out. And so we are, you know, full on come come late summer, early fall. So you know, make sure you're, you know, you're refitted for your wetsuits because uh, I don't know if you've been eating too much like myself over the over the last year, but I'll probably need a new wetsuit. But okay, uh, that being said, um, I'm happy to be back. I know many of you thought that we got rid of me. Um, he just know that we does not hold power over me. And like he never will. I'm, 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 you know, fully, fully back. I'm, and uh, the whatever the case, I've been kind of working part time like at a brewery. I don't have power over you. <laughs> yeah, you, nor, nor will you ever. But whatever the case, has been, been good. You know, I, I hate to have missed these, and I'm sorry you all had to deal with Lee. You know, and I'm sorry Brian had to deal with Lee while I've been gone. But I'm, you know, I'm back. If we can do well, these on Sundays more regularly. All right. All right. From uh, so yeah, fish ID, everybody. I, I, you know, I almost forgot what fish look like by now, but no, um, it was right. It, it was good to kind of go through a few pictures. So, what we've got in, in store for you today, Lee's going to kind of run through his uh, fish ID rep, uh, presentation, which is really cool. It's an excellent uh, overview of how to ID fish in the field. Um, because it's not as easy as, as uh, one might think, um, as all of you who have been on trips with us realize, you're looking at literally a thousand species during one of our trips. And so, and many, many different variants of each species can exist. So we're gonna just go uh, quickly through a few slides of just fish and then get into kind of how to ID them as we go. So let's, you know, without further ado, let's go for it. All right. Yes. So, so again, um, if you can just uh, stop real quick here. Again, you know, on any one of our trips out in the Coral Triangle, uh, we will be observing hundreds of different species and possibly over a thousand um, just on our snorkels. I mean, it, it is potentially, you know, we've never done something like this is actually try to count species because that would be over an overwhelming task to be honest, and you probably wouldn't enjoy the, your actual snorkels if we attempted that. But, and, and normally what we're doing is kind of letting a lot of the obscure or the, the, the fish that we see kind of on an everyday basis, we don't even bother looking at them and look for more of the cryptic or the rare or the venomous, things like that um, to point out to you know, our fellow snorkelers. So something like this, which is the demon stinger, Inimicus didactylus, um, which is a, you know, a, we, we see almost every trip out in the coral, tri coral triangle when you're in sandy habitats. But as Lee will get into, a lot of fish ID, it's not about the colors, as he will certainly talk about. Much of it is about the habitat and behaviors. So just 
you know, and I know it's, you've, many of you have been out of the water for a long time. Um, so it'll take a while to get back. Um, you know, we'll make the first test on the first trip very easy at the end of the trip. Make sure we, we get your ticket questions. home, right? Um, but uh, whatever the case, so remember habitat and behavior really uh, is a good or really good indicators of what fish that you're seeing. And one more thing before we start to uh, refish identification. I mean, w one of the reasons why we snorkel and why we travel all the way across the planet is to look at fish, and they be they are such an, an you know an unbelievable form of life on this planet in terms of how diverse uh, telios, bony fish are. Uh, you know, let alone elasmobranchs. Um, and we're not really going to be talking much about elasmobranchs in, in this um, presentation. It's more focused on the bony fish that we would normally see on a very shallow reef. But, um, what, you know, the beauty of what we do is that you're getting up close and personal to these. And really, as we probably said many times over, there is no other, you know, wilderness experience that you can have where you're getting up close and personal within you know, several feet or even inches sometimes uh, to the wildlife that you're there to see. And that's the, the beauty of the tropic, you know, tropical coral reefs. You can get up close to many of these species um, and not, you know, without having to chase them down or stress them out or anything like that. And of course, knowing what they are, at least the basic names and knowing where they fit into the overall ecology of the area really kind of expands your interest uh, in, you know, how everything works out there. So uh, I'm going to let we kind of go, go over uh, some of the, you know, bits and pieces of, of fish, and then we'll get more into some of the, the ecological aspects of them. Yeah, so for, uh, for you guys who've been on our trips before, a lot of these slides will look familiar, if not, if not distance in memory, at least uh, somewhat familiar, <laughs> even look, me looking at them like, this is, seems like a lifetime ago. But um, first thing we'll do is kind of get familiar with um, some of the, you know, the obvious body parts of a fish, because when it comes to IDing a fish, um, knowing, you know, just kind of the, the general terminology of, and, and where the, the fins are, for example, uh, is important. Again, the, the color is not important. It's really the, you know, the, as you'll see, is it swimming and then habitat and certainly, um, you know, some of the other characteristics like the dorsal fin, which is located on the top of the fish, the second dorsal just behind that, the caudal or tail fin, which is, uh, you know, pretty obvious. Anal fin uh, is just below the second dorsal. Pelvic fin uh, is below the dorsal fin, so kind of acts as um, kind of, you, you know, the bottom stabilizer, if you will. Pectoral fins on the side. Operculum is the gill cover. Barbels for some fish, like the goldfish that we have in the picture, uh, which they use to kind of stir up sand and look for food. And Siri, which are on the blennies, which, which is kind of interesting because they're not sure if they're, if they're sensory or if they were for camouflage. And the camouflage part is a little bit more interesting to me because I would understand the sensory part, right? I mean, I think they could be like, whiskers in a way for cats in the way to understand, you know, cats use them to kind of get an idea for spacing issues. Um, but for camouflage, you would think, well, why? But if, again, you think of the habitats of a lot of blennies and they hide inside holes. So when they stick their heads out, if they have these appendages coming out, it kind of breaks up the pattern of their head. And again, looks like lots of tuft of algae or small branches of sponge or coral that are around the hole. So it may add a, a, the, you know, the benefit of camouflage um, as well as being sensory. Again, um, because they are in these small holes, may give them you know, like the way cats use whiskers or they may actually um, be chemosensory. I mean, they, we just don't know yet.
but uh, that's certainly something that is specific, well, most common in uh, fish like blennies. So, uh, so that being said, Lee, um, what other fish have Siri? And I'm, I'm all the only thing that came to mind, like we're like Ambon scorpion fish, and those are obviously, you know, uh, camouflage type of, you know, appendages. But are there any other fish tropical, you know, that we see that have Siri other than blennies? Right, I'm trying to think. And even the blennies that exist in cold water have, you know, Siri. Um, and again, it might be because it's, it might be a type of camouflage or it might be because of their, their habitat or their, their general uh, behavior, which is, to, which is to hide in holes and basically perch from in the hole and stick their head out. So again, to me, it would make sense. Like that's a great form of camouflage um, where you, again, you're, you're disrupting the outline of the head or uh, potentially covering the eye. But one, not all blennies hide in holes. Matter of fact, a lot of them don't. And two, a lot of them, their Siri are not easily seen. And when you look at the blenny, you're like, okay, but then you have to look up real close and see, oh yeah, it does have some but they're just really, really small. I mean, the picture that I chose here, um, you know, just kind of exaggerated the Siri for, you know, for, you know, obvious reasons, just so that people uh, get an idea of, of what they, you know, look at. But um, I think that picture is more of an exception than the Siri that we see on kind of the general reef fish. So again, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an, you know, a, a good question. Um, and what other ones have Siri? I mean, the hawkfish, uh, not over the eyes as much, but the, I mean, the hawkfish, the family name is Sirhididae because they've got these little, they're called Siri. They're a little different, but they are still called Siri. They're like little fluffy, tough things on the dorsal spines. That's and right, so right. I'm not exactly sure if it has the same reasoning, same evolutionary purpose, uh, but technically I think they are still called Siri. So the hawkfish would have those. Right. And that's, and that, that's, that's, a great example because to me that is even more of <laughs> of like why yeah because you know like this one i can you know you, you, i can kind of explain it away a little bit you know again i because they because of their behavior they live in holes because of, you know um their yeah. lifestyle you could say that there's there's a couple different reasons but hawkfish like you know you think about it it's it's tufts you know if you guys aren't familiar with brian's talking about it the tufts are basically line the, the dorsal. They go right down the dorsal fin. So if you get close, you can see these like little pom-poms, if you will, on this dorsal spine of, of on each dorsal spine as it goes down the dorsal fin. Like what would be the reasoning for that? And it's really it's interesting. All right, again, just to get into um, uh, the external anatomy, just, general shapes. And I know we didn't talk about, I know we talked about color as not being um, as important of an, you know, uh, of a characteristic you look for. Stripes and bars and bands, they are. Um, so you have bars, which are usually vertical on the fish. So if you came up and you said you saw a fish that had these black bars, I'd immediately be thinking, you know, these vertical bars, think, think of a jail cell, down the side of the fish, as opposed to stripes which tend to be horizontal. Again, think of like sergeant stripes where, you know, the, the kind of the patch has the bar, the, the stripes going uh, horizontally and bands, which tend to be diagonal. Though most people, including myself, end up saying uh, diagonal stripes is what I, what I end up saying. Um, speckles, you know, uh, speckles are pretty easy to, to, to figure out. A blotch is just kind of an unconsolidated spot, which, um, which again, a spot is something significant as opposed to speckles, which, uh, which are just kind of like little pinpoints as opposed to a large spot. I think everybody here kind of gets, gets, uh, gets that point. And the oscillated spot, which is a spot that has a circle around it. And there are quite a few fish that, uh, that have that. There's several butterfly fish um, that have these oscillated spots. Um, and again, really interesting, you know, what would be the purpose other than, again, when you think about the false eye, um, Usually you kind of have this, you know, this, the, 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 um, 
the eye, you know, the eye, and then it's kind of surrounded by the, the white material. And maybe perhaps this is just the outline of the outer eye of, of the, um, you know, that they're trying to use as a type of camouflage. Um, to the left side of the screen, there's round or robust fish. So again, if you came in and you said, yeah, I saw this huge bulky fish, it's round as fish, I'd be thinking things like this grouper, um, as opposed to compressed, like the angel fishes or butterfly fishes, where if you look at them straight on, they are very thin uh, versus flattened, like the crocodile fish or flounder, which tend to sit on the bottom, tend to be bottom dwellers. And by doing that, they tend to be uh, more low profile, which gives them a better chance to uh, blend into the surroundings, which is you know, ultimately what they're trying to do um, in most cases. All right, again, is coloration the key? You know, the example I chose here is this, uh, this um, grouper, the black spine grouper. And you can see in both these pictures, it's the same fish. And the diagnostic here is the black lines or spots along the dorsal spines here. That's where it gets its name. But that's not always easy to see. And when you go down and you see the fish on the kind of the left side of the screen here, the reddish one, and you come up and say, I saw this reddish fish. And then we start going from there. The book may actually have the picture on the right. Or you might see the picture on the right. And then you come up and you see, and you're looking through the book and like, you see this fish in the book, you're like, there's no way it's this fish on the right. It's because a lot of fish are able to change their colors or mute their colors. So in this case, it's not really changing, I guess in a way it is changing its colors, but certainly a lot of um, uh, surgeon fish, for example, uh, can't really change their color, but they can mute them to the point where, you know, they might be bright blue and then be kind of this dark beige. Um, in this case, it turns from reddish to whitish. So coloration for identification purposes is not the first thing to go for. It's not your go-to type of um, diagnostic. I mean, it's certainly what would attract you to the fish, for example. I mean, we see, go underwater and we see all these beautiful colored fish and we're like, you know, it's just amazing to see all these colors. But for identification purposes, it's better to ask other questions first. I mean, certain, certain and fish And this is the first one I would ask is, is it swimming? I was just gonna say, certain, certain fish have four phases in their life history, let alone being able to mute uh, their their coloration. So right, you know, as, as Lee was saying, I mean, uh, yeah, you uh, University of Guam, where both Lee and I went, um, where we got a B in ichthyology, B, right? You got in ichthyology, Lee? Well, I got the A. Anyway. I got an A. Um, I got an A, but well, it's a long story. Okay. All right. Long story. But uh, uh, anyway, when we were learning how to uh, identify fish, uh, at least in, in my year, we drew them. And those bar, those characteristic bars and stripes uh, were, were the, really the best indicators of uh, many of the species that we see. Yeah, so I, I ended up having Ethan same professor in his last year he was teaching there. And I, we weren't drawing anything. But then again, I wouldn't know because I never went to the lab. And that's why I ended up getting a B in the class because uh -huh. I was working. I was working for, you, working for the government. And I asked him, hey, yeah, I had already been guiding in Palau for several years. I'm like, man, I know my fish. Just can I come in? I'll take the test. And then if I can just not come to the labs, you know, so I can work. And he's like, yeah, sure, no problem. And it was great because when I took the tests, um, another one of our friend, Brent, you guys might have been with him in uh, Wakatobi. Uh, I'd be like, Brent, all right, I'll be right back. <laughs> I have a test. I would go in there and he would just have pictures of all the fish and he just had to write down a name. I'd be like, zoom, 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 zoom. zoom. Okay, five minutes later, I'm done. And it's because I knew my fish, but he didn't like the fact that I just never in class and he felt that I needed, that I had to be, you know, demoted, I guess, over the other students who were there, you know, in fairness, the other students, but I'm, that, that was, that's, no, I still got, I, I, I even got know, the extra credit. Seen, 
using the excuse of working for government of Guam is no excuse at all. Like, it's actually, I can't. You can, put, you can put the quote, you can put working in quotes. Even though I was there, it's still in quotes because <laughs> I'm not uh -huh. sure I was actually ever working there. Okay, so was it swimming? That is the question that I would ask myself first. And it seems like kind of a dumb question to ask for fish. But actually, when you think about it, a lot of fish aren't really swimming. And if they are swimming, what fins are they using? So we just talked about fins, you know, dorsal fins, pelvic fins are the ones on the sides versus the tail fin. And different families of fishes can be identified solely on what fins they were using for swimming or were they swimming at all? And that's the key, right? Because when we come back from the boat and we, you know, we saw, like Ethan mentioned, I mean, we could see thousands of fish representing, you know, hundreds of families on any given day of snorkeling in the tropics. And it's like, with all of that information, you know, you're going to go through these books and these books, you know, they're especially, you know, Allen's encyclopedias, you know, it's a thousand pages with seven or eight pictures on each page. I mean, you're going to go through it one by one, like, okay, it wasn't that one, it wasn't that one. The key is to try and narrow it down. You know, how do we get from a thousand pages to 30 pages? Because 30 pages is manageable. And especially when you have, you know, a dozen fish you're trying to ID, you, know, you certainly don't want to go through a thousand pages every time for each one of those fish. So the key is to try and narrow it down. Well, again, if you observe what type of fins it was swimming with, you can narrow it down. So, for example, sorry guys, for example, was it swimming with fins? No. Well, there's a lot of fish like wrasses, parrotfish, butterfly fish that are swimming. If they're not swimming, it's because they're lying on the bottom dead. But otherwise, they'll be swimming. Which means if the fish you saw, and assuming it's alive, was sitting on the bottom, then you can eliminate all those wrasses. You can eliminate the parrotfish. You can eliminate the butterfly fishes. You can eliminate certain fishes. I mean, you can just, if it wasn't swimming and it was just sitting on the bottom, bottom or just hovering off of the bottom, and when I, I'm gonna use hovering a couple times here um, on both sides of that line, that vertical bar. Um, when I, talk about hovering as opposed to not swim or you know in reference to not swimming i'm talking about fish that are hovering just off the bottom so that you know you can associate the fish with the bottom as opposed to hovering high up in the water column where you would associate the fish with with swimming so if it was hovering just off the bottom or sitting on the bottom you can eliminate a huge number of families of fishes right off the bat i mean doesn't even matter what color the fish was how big it was doesn't, none of that matters. The fact that it was just sitting on the bottom and not swimming and not dead means you can eliminate a huge number of those families of fishes. So that, that's huge. Again, thousand page book now probably goes down to, again, fish swimming, if it was just sitting on the bottom, you probably down to just 10% of those pages, probably only hundred pages of fish that are just sitting on the bottom versus where you would normally see them swimming versus a fish that was normally swimming. Here we are, was it swimming? Yeah, it was swimming, okay. Now, was it hovering off the bottom significantly? So again, when you're swimming, it was hovering, you know, five feet or more off the bottom, then okay, fair enough. You could consider that say swimming, even though it was just sitting there. And if it, you know, if it was actually swimming, like it was actually moving in the water, what fins were they swimming with? Again, this is huge. Was it swimming with his pectoral fins? Was it swimming with its dorsal anal fins? Was it swimming with its tail fins? And these are gonna be very obvious. If it's swimming with its pectoral fins, it's flapping like a bird through the water. And pretty, pretty, you know, it's not just flapping once and then hovering. It'll be flapping pretty, you know, pretty rigorously as it's moving through the water. Was it using its dorsal and anal fins? So again, dorsal on the top of the fish, on the top of the body, anal underneath. Was it swimming with uh, the dorsal and anal fins? Or was it swimming with his tail fins? And that's kind of where, you know, the fins that we're most, you know, familiar with fish swimming with. Uh, was it swimming with its tail fin? Now, in these cases, you're observing the fish in its natural behavior. 
Because if you go and scare that fish, it's going to use all of its fins to get away from you. So in which case you can say, well, I'm not sure. It was swimming with its tail fin and its pectoral fins. Well, yeah, because it was trying to get away from you. But if you're observing it and it's kind of natural swimming behavior, it will definitely um, resort to how it, you know, how it swims, how what, what fins it uses. So in the cases of wrasses, parrotfish, surging fish, they swim with their pectoral fins. So again, if you see a fish swimming with its pectoral fins, you know right away. You first of all, you eliminated all the ones sitting on the bottom, and you can eliminate the ones that don't swim in their pectoral fins. So groupers, it's not going to be a grouper swimming with its pectoral fin. It's not going to be barracuda swimming with its pectoral fins. So again, you're taking that thousand-page book and reducing it down to just a few families of fishes. Same with the dorsal, anal, and same with the tail. And those are just examples which, which we will get into. Okay, once you've answered that question, then I go into colors, patterns, and behaviors. And, you know, one of the things that I think Ethan and I, um, we're gonna start kind of putting more stock into, I think a lot of it is because you guys that have co been coming with us are, you know, you're getting, you're getting pretty good out there, um, is we're gonna get into more of the habitat as, as another really important diagnostic. And the reason I bring that up is because here is a great example of understanding habitat versus some of the other diagnostics. Many, many years ago, um, when, uh, when we were using the mermaid to go to Komodo, um, there was a fellow on the boat, his name was Dolphin. And Dolphin at that time already had thousands of dives in Komodo, thousands of dives. He's seen just about everything. We're snorkeling in a place called Batu Manchu and I hear him yelling for me, like it seemed like a mile away. And people started kind of leapfrogging down, kind of like passing the, 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 you know, the yelling, if you will, you know, Dolphin would yell and then someone closer to, to me would yell for me and then someone closer until we started this chain. And um, by the time it got to me, I'm hearing Dolphin found a really rare fish. I'm like, well, if Dolphin found a rare fish, then it's gotta be super rare. So I snorkel back, you know, with, with excitement. I'm like, I can't wait to see what he found. And I get there and there's, there's nothing there, and you know, fair enough. Um, and he's just like, wait, 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 okay. Okay, wait, wait. And then all of a sudden it popped up and it was this gorgeous juvenile um, Javanese damselfish. Gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And you guys are probably all familiar with it. And you know why? Because we see it all the time snorkeling. Remember, dolphin, at the time, this was many years ago when we first started going snorkeling to Komodo, he'd never snorkeled Komodo before. So all the fish up in the shallows, he was not familiar with at all. And a juvenile Javanese damselfish, gorgeous fish. So of course he was really excited about it. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, okay. And I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not taking down his excitement, but um, I'm like, yeah, juvenile Javanese damselfish. And then I think I immediately swam away. And <laughs> I think later on the boat, he's like, I'm going to take a picture of it. I, you know, I, 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 I have a few of them. But my point here is habitat is also really important because if you understand the habitat of a lot of these fish, then that will also help with identification. Um, juvenile Javanese damselfish hang out in branching corals in shallow water, almost no other places. So again, you know, I want to add habitat to the bottom there because I think that's also an important diagnostic. Ethan, you want to jump in at anything? Yeah, I just wanted to say, like, if we call you from a, whether it be a short way or a long way off, um, it's usually to show you something that, you know, we find interesting. So at least fake taking a picture of it, at least give us that pleasure, even if you don't like it. Because one of our favorite guests, and I'm not going to name names, but we, she had been wanting to see a particular fish that is very rare a seahorse and we spent a long time finding that seahorse for her you know after several days of searching hours. Like, uh, like four hours. hours 
in mucky habitat and he found one he was so excited and she swam over and i think she says it, it looks dirty and turned away and we was we's never been the same since and wow. you know if you're out there you know who you are and we love you but you you damaged lee even further than he, yeah, he already I, was damaged. I, don't, I don't like those seeing those fish anymore like I won't call anyone over unless you specifically ask for it. And even then I'll just show it to someone else and say, hey, show it to that person. Let them take the brunt <laughs> of it. But, um, you know, for those of us in the Philippines, another good example, we had the, um, the dive guides, the cruise directors on the um, Philippine siren. And they also never snorkel in the Philippines and they were going crazy over pipe, pipe fishes. Meanwhile, all of us snorkeling pipe fishes all day any day you want, all day, but they never see them. So habitat's really important. Okay, anyway, what spins was it swimming with? Very, very important. Actually, to pause it here for a sec, you mentioned, yeah, yeah. you know, you mentioned if it's, you know, sitting on the ground and it, you know, you thought it was a parrot fish, it's probably dead. Yeah, there you go, there's the Javanese. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, if it's sitting on the ground and thought it was a parrot fish, it's probably a dead fish. If you go snorkeling at night, one of the coolest things to see are, are parrotfish laying and sleeping in a little cocoon of mucus. Coolest thing. They're just so weird right, to see right. fish that are normally always swimming around, motoring around the reef. It's so cool to see them literally just flopped over on their side asleep. Just so weird. <laughs> yeah, true enough. Okay, swimming with their pet for toro fins. Okay, so here's some examples. Uh, again, here's our parrotfish. So pectoral fins. Fins on the side, fins on the side, fins on the side, surgeon fishes, wrasses, parrot fishes. So if you see a fish swimming and it's flapping its fins, moving through the water, those are the families I would start with and probably end with. You're probably gonna be, you know, you're finding your fish if you look here first. And that just shows you how important it is. Because again, you had thousand pages, now you're down to probably just a hundred pages again. You know, these three families, wrasses are pretty, pretty robust family of fishes, but still between all of these fishes, it's not going to be more than, than, you know, 40 or 50 pages. So again, trying to narrow it down and a great way to do it, swim with the pectoral fins. If it's them, parrot fishes, wrasses, certain fish. All right, dorsal fins. Um, trigger fishes, file fishes, puffers, and box fishes. Again, uh, these are the types of fishes that you will see blatantly swimming with these fins. So if you're out there on the reef and you see these fins, you know, the trigger fishes usually out in the water column. A lot of times, so a lot of times the trigger fishes might just be hovering there. But if you get them to move or if they're moving, then you will see they're going to be swimming with their dorsal and anal fins. And you can see how you know, big they are compared to other fishes because they are using them to swim. The file fishes, same thing. Now file fishes tend to be more closely associated with the reef. Um, their fins tend to wave, you know, kind of undulate as opposed to kind of flap back and forth. But again, if it's a thin fish and it is swimming primarily by moving its dorsal and anal fins, again, start here. And the great thing is, between these two families right here, you're only talking 10 pages. So you can certainly, uh, you know, you narrow down a significant portion of that book just by knowing that the fins are swimming or the fish are swimming with their dorsal and anal fins. Box, fish and, uh, box fishes and puffers, they're certainly more obvious, um, you know, with their body type. But again, if, you know, you're not really sure, you know, you're, it's a distance away, then again, seeing them swim with their dorsal and anal is, is a, Good giveaway. All right, those that tend to hover, um, you know, kind of above the water, again, trigger fishes, I just mentioned that. Uh, they tend to hover up in the water column. Um, uh, bat fishes, spade fishes, same thing. They tend to hover up in the water column. Um, emperors, barracuda, same thing. So if you see these, you know, silvery fish, and again, they tend to be silvery, kind of drab in color because they are up in the water column as a way to camouflage themselves against the background, the ambient background. Now, I use the 
very the most colorful of the trigger fishes as my example. These you know trigger fishes tend to not hang as high in the water column as say the yellow margin um, trigger fishes, which do tend to be more drab in color. But um, you know again as a family, trigger fishes tend to hang up in the water column. Those sitting on the bottom um, are dragonets, all of our type of um, uh, scorpion type fishes. Here's our blennies again, and here's one of our hawk fishes right here. So these are types of, of families of fishes that in general, they are closely associated with the bottom. So if you see anything crawling along the bottom like this, sitting on the bottom like this, or sitting on coral, like these guys, this is where I would start. Sitting on the bottom, I would start with these family of fishes because you will not see blennies swimming up in the reef unless it's a, a fang tooth blenny, which is a different family, which is, eh, it's kind of a subfamily. And it's a little bit more, you know, it requires a little bit more advanced, um, you know, in the identification process. But fortunately, there aren't very many of them. Um, so you can kind of, you know, eliminate them unless it was something, you know, that's where you would start getting into the coloration and, and more of the behavior. Um, you know, scorpion fishes are not going to be swimming up in the uh, water column unless it's like a lionfish, but they tend to hover up in the water column and they are pretty obvious in, uh, in their design. Same with the hawk fishes, they're always going to be associated with coral. Um, they don't even have swim bladders. Um, so they, it's because they basically evolved to just perch on coral and use it for uh, protection as well. All right, those that tend to hover just off of the bottom, uh, groupers, several species of groupers that do that, though most groupers are sitting on the bottom. So again, you know, these are kind of the, the there's always gonna be exceptions, right? Um, so these are some of the exceptions. The good thing is groupers tend to be very robust. So you see a grouper sitting on the bottom uh, or a grouper just hovering off the bottom. Usually, you know, you're like, okay, that, that's a pretty, pretty robust, you know, biggish fish. So if you came back to us and said something, you're like, well, it was kind of hovering just off the bottom. Um, you know, I'm not really sure, but it was definitely robust. You know, it wasn't swimming with any fins that I could tell, but it was robust and it was just hovering. This is where I think we would uh, we would start. Um, a lot of gobies uh, will also hover just off the bottom, though there are those like the shrimp gobies that perch absolutely on the bottom. And again, these are kind of the exceptions uh, that you just have to look out for and just get you know get familiar with with that um, as uh, kind of a general rule that there are families that have uh, that have both. Okay, so here we are. Um, again, we go back to kind of this, this key, you know, if I talk about this sometimes, if you guys are familiar with keying things out, um, you know, you start with the big question and you kind of ask a series of yes, no questions that boil it down to a very specific, uh, species, you know, and, you know, for the sake of saving time, we're going to not ask the, the obvious question is, you know, was it in the ocean? Uh, was it in warm water? Cause these are the types of questions you could ask. You know, was it in the ocean? Was it in warm water? Because, you know, we're a talking tropical versus uh, uh, temperate. But what fins was it swimming with? Well, was it swimming with fins? Yes, it was. Okay. What types of fins was it swimming with? Was it hovering? No. So it was absolutely swimming? Yes. Okay. What fins were they swimming with? Well, they were swimming with pectoral fins. And that leads us, of course, right to the family of fishes that we should be looking at. So you can see how this chart just flows in asking these yes, no questions based on was it swimming? And again, it seemed in the beginning to be a nonsensical question in the terms of fish, but you can see, and when we get into the kind of the more detailed analysis of it, um, it's actually a, a pretty good question, a pretty good thing to look for when you find a fish, you're like, you're not sure what it is to make that observation. And just make that quick observation. You know, I know colors draws right away, but you know, 
okay, it's this beautiful fish. It was greenish with these blue patterns and oh, it was gorgeous. Okay, but just take a quick look. What fins was it swimming with? And that will take you to narrowing down the families of fishes just to avoid having to thumb through all those pages. All right. Okay, so now that we kind of have an idea of what we're looking for, um, when we get into the more details of some of these families, there are lots of families of fishes that look the same, though some of the characteristics, you know, are not consistent within that family of fishes. So a, a good example are the unicorn fishes versus certain fishes. They're both thin, they're both, you know, um, you know, uh, what was it, what was the term? <laughs> um, compressed. Right. Thank you. Both compressed, so you know they you know they both um, swim with their pectoral fins. So when you go from there, you're like, okay, you know the good thing is there aren't very many pages you have to go through to to identify if you're not sure if it was a unicorn versus a certain fish. But unicorn fishes tend to have this very prominent unicorn, so that might be a really good diagnostic. So you already got down what fins are they swimming with. And in some cases with unicorn fish, just seeing that unicorn is like, that's enough. I don't even need to see what it's swimming with. I already know it's unicorn fish. There's only one problem with that. This is also a unicorn fish. This is the orange spine unicorn fish versus the blue spine unicorn fish. But the orange spine unicorn fish doesn't have a unicorn. So it then becomes a little harder. So now you're like, oh, well, this must be a surgeon fish because it doesn't have a unicorn. I guess what we're trying to say is don't necessarily box yourself in to thinking it has to be a unicorn fish or a unicorn fish has to have a unicorn. Again, the most important thing you can identify is that it was swimming with its pectoral fins because looking at the overall families, both unicorn and certain fishes, it's not very many pages and you won't get fooled by thinking this must not be a unicorn fish in the absence of the unicorn. And here we go. Um, the orange spine, or I'm sorry, this is the blue spotted, uh, blue spine unicorn fish versus the certain fish. Now, again, I just kind of talked about them not being, you know, very hard. You don't want to eliminate one or the other. If you can get close enough, there is a way that you can absolutely identify them by their given family, even in the absence of the unicorn. And that's because unicorn fishes have two spines versus certain fishes that only have one. And again, sometimes it's hard to see, but for, again, for the blue spine unicorn fish or the orange spine in the previous slide, or for the unicorns, the, um, when, the, um, when this uh, spine is exposed and colored like this, if you can make that determination, that's also a given right there. So you kind of saw this swimming with its pectoral fins. And then if you got close enough and you saw it had two versus one, two unicorn fish, one certain fish every time. All right, trying to identify triggers versus file fishes. This again is, and, and Ethan and I, you know, for this reason, we are getting more into um, understanding habitat. Trigger fishes tend to be, uh, tend to hover above the reef. Or even those that spend time on the reef tend to still hover, you know, kind of above it. Where file fishes, these guys, tend to associate very closely with the reef, often swimming in and around and through and under coral. So if you see a fish that is swimming with its dorsal and anal fin, and it is compressed, excuse me, and it is compressed, then the easy diagnostic being able to separate them out is where was it in relation to the reef? Was it hovering above the reef? Trigger fish is where I'd start. Was it really closely associated reef, tight with the reef? I would go file fishes. Now, there are some trigger fishes like the Picasso trigger that nest in the sand and nest in rock and rubble so that they are kind of associated with the reef. But even those guys, when they are not being scared or skittish, are hovering above the reef, several feet, 
yards, meters above the reef. Well, meter above the reef. Where the trigger fishes are almost never above the reef. They're almost, or the, I'm sorry, the file fishes are almost exclusively associated with the reef. All right, and here's another good example of, uh, of a file fish. The weedy. All right, angel fishes versus um, butterfly fishes. Again, this is a little bit, uh, they can be hard because they both share the same habitat. They're both colorful. They're both compressed. They're both around the same size, except for the pomacanthus um, angel fishes, which tend to be bigger. But a good way to tell them apart is looking at their snouts. Angel fishes are omnivores. They'll feed on sponges, um, coral. Uh, they'll pick off little parasite or little things on the reef. Um, algae, where butterfly fishes tend to be specialists on coral polyps. And they've evolved in their, in, to, to um, specialize in that. So again, where these guys are omnivores, they just have kind of what we would consider a normal kind of fish snout. You know, it's nothing, nothing pronounced about it. It's just kind of this beak like that allows them to go down to the reef and kind of pick off things, take tiny bites out of things. Where the butterfly fishes with this elongated snout can go in, remember coral has nematocysts, they're stinging. Now to us, we may not necessarily feel it, but to something much smaller, you know, the, the ability for that coral to sting them, you know, might, might end up being, uh, you know, they might end up feeling it. So what they evolved is these pincer like uh, mouths so that they go and they can go and pick off individual polyps of the coral. It allows them to stick their snout within the branches of coral without having to stuff their whole face and potentially get stung. So by having these precise, uh, you know, kind of pincers uh, of mouths, they're able to go and pick off tiny polyps of the coral. So that's a good way to tell them apart. I mean, almost right away. If you see that has a snout versus not, uh, it's a butterfly versus the angel. All right, snappers versus emperors, very, very hard. Um, again, you know, it's good that there are not many pages and they're in a you know, pretty close family, so they're right next to each other. Um, I haven't yet really figured out a good way to tell them apart. Both of them tend to hover above the reef. They tend to be drab in color. They swim at their tails, but they're hovering most of the time. So you may not necessarily see that. Big eyes, which are also very closely associated with um, emperors and snappers, have much larger eyes compared to the size of their head versus the snappers and emperors. Um, but to, if, if, if you see a robust type of fish hovering significantly above the reef, I would go here. Because you're probably also gonna go with groupers too, which again, is fair enough. And groupers, these guys, snappers, emperors, all swim with their tails. So you'll end up probably going through all the different family, all these um, families, snappers, emperors, and groupers. Fair enough. Again, we're talking about 20 pages versus 1,000. So if we can narrow it down, which is all we're trying to do, then just seeing where, what they're doing. Were they swimming? No, they were generally hovering. OK, and they were robust. You can start go from there. All right, cornet versus trumpet fish. Uh, this one, again, cornet fish tend to associate closer to the reef than trumpet fish, but that is definitely not always the case. Absolutely not. But one thing you can always tell, because this coronet fish is silvery, but they can change their colors. They can actually become, they can actually look much like this trumpet fish if they wanted to, or they can have stripes and, and uh, bars along their body as a way to camouflage. But one thing for sure, if you look at their tail, the tail always just comes to a point and there's no material, there's no dorsal spines or any filaments associated with the long tail, where the cornet fish has an actual tail as we recognize fish having. 
you know, um, filaments and um, material that, uh, that, you know, um, that forms the, the actual fin. So look at their tails and you can uh, tell right away the difference between a coronet versus the trumpet fish. All right, scad versus fusiliers. Uh, again, both these fish swim with their fins, their tail fins. Um, they're both, um, you know, kind of silvery in uh, in coloration. They're, you know, kind of robust, though they're they're you know definitely smaller. You know, probably between six and twelve inches in uh, size, or six and eight inches in size. They both school in fairly large schools. But here's one thing you can tell. You know, not a definite, but pretty, pretty good. Again, habitat. Scad tend to always be in sheltered places, especially associating with man-made protection thing items on the reef, like jetties and and docks and um, places like that, where there's where there's a fair bit of protection. If you see a huge school of these fish associated with a dock or a jetty or you know any kind of um, protection in the water is probably scad versus fusiliers which tend to spend their time out on the reef though they are found in the lagoon as well they do tend to be more associated with the reef as opposed to places that are more about protection from the reef and again this is um, you know, it, it's not 100%, but it's, it's pretty close because you're not going to see scad out on the reef um, like you'll see fusiliers. So if you see silvery fish out on the reef, uh, you know, you're swimming out on the reef and you see silvery fish, uh, go to fusiliers first versus if you're swimming in a jetty or like the dock at the Pearl Farm in Rajampat, um, you know, those are huge schools of scad because that's the places where, that, where they tend to, uh, tend to congregate. Puffers versus box fish. Again, they both swim in their pectoral fins. So um, that'll give you the general diagnostic um, if you're not sure of either, but trying to separate them out becomes a little tougher. Puffer fishes tend to be rounder than box fishes. Box fish, they have that bony carapace, you know, those bony scales, that inner lock that give them that rigid skeleton that almost looks box-like, gives, you know, hence their name. Versus the puffer fishes, which tend to be round um, they don't have the bony structure. They can, of course, inflate themselves as a way to protect themselves. Um, but as far as habitat, even, you can see both of them side by side. Um, so the habitat is not really a great diagnostic either. The way to really tell them apart is, you know, as you're looking at them, because they are really cool looking fish, um, as you're looking at them, um, notice this shape. And the box fish are definitely more square like versus puffer fish, which are more spherical. Now, some of the larger puffer fishes, star puffers, map puffers, they tend to hover up in the water column. So if you see one of those big guys in the water column, chances are good it is not a box fish. Box fishes just don't get that big. Um, though this, uh, the yellow box fish, uh, a nice big mature male can, you know, still get a, you know, foot long in size. But some of the puffer fishes, the map puffers can be three feet in length. Damsels versus Antheus. Uh, again, tricky because both of them swim with their dorsal fin, though a lot of times they'll swim with their pectorals too. And a lot of that is because they're maneuvering around the reef, but they tend to swim with the, their, um, their uh, did I say dorsal fin? I meant to say their tail fin. They both swim with their tail fin. Uh, they're, they're both colorful. They're both smaller, you know, a couple inches to, to several inches in length. Um, they both tend to school. So it's kind of tricky to separate them out. One way to tell for sure, well, not for sure, but one thing to look for are dandel fishes, when you see a school of them, tend to all be the same general color, where antheus are harem species, where the male tends to be, tends to be more colorful, uh, but very different color than the females. So if you see a school of these damsel looking fishes, but one of them, which is most, you know, 
uh, obviously hurting the bunch of other fishes that may look different in coloration, but the same in shape and size, they're, they're gonna be antheus versus damsels. Um, another kind of unfortunate thing about these guys is the pages. There's a lot of damsels, there's a lot of antheus. Um, so if you do see a school of colorful fish that closely associate with the reef, uh, you're not sure what they are. If you can see the antheus, you know, very definite um, harem where the male is you know tightly controlling the females um, versus uh, the damselfish where they're just kind of all hanging out there but there's no real coherency to the school that might give you a way to separate them out guys excuse me I'm going to turn my turn the light on real quick and and well while he's gone and another characteristic um I'm back of, before he confuses you don't confuse them of, of where they are, they they really like currenty areas. Uh, whereas, I mean, they'll be very obvious in areas that receive quite a bit of current, feeding on plankton. Uh, you know, Excuse a meter me. from from zero to a meter or two away from the reef. Whereas damselfish rarely venture that far from the reef. They're almost always very close in uh, to the protection of corals or hydroids, things like that. Yeah, and actually to go one one step further again, um, and you know, you could say that most of the damsel fishes that we see also tend to associate with branching coral. Um, and antheists don't necessarily associate at all with the coral as much as they do just the reef. So they'll kind of have their home range, which may not be very big and may only be 10, you know, square square feet on the reef, but you know, if you spook them they don't have like a home coral, like a lot of damsel will. Um, but again, that's, you know, you'd have to spend a little bit of time kind of observing that, but just knowing that, you know, things to look for, especially if it's a nice colorful, uh, smaller reef fish like this will help with the identification, at least try and, you know, we're trying to narrow down that book. And, you know, even if you can narrow them down to just damsels and ant damsel fish versus an antheus, it's not the end of the world. There, it's a nice, uh, great example of uh, damsels. And notice they are all identifying, they're all associating with the branch and coral. Antheus. You can see kind of currenty areas and they're all kind of nosed into the current. All right, lizard fish versus sand perches. Um, they both dwell on the bottom. So, you know, you're gonna ask, are they swimming? No, no, they're sitting on the bottom. Okay, fair enough. Again, you've been able to eliminate, you know, even if you're not sure from here, you know, it's just gonna be a few families of fishes of which these guys will be a part of, of those that just sit on the bottom. But there is a way to tell them apart um, if you can get close enough. Lizard fishes sit on their belly where sand perches literally perch, hence again, their name, on their um, uh, dorsal oh. fins, on their pelvic oh. fins, thank you. Uh, they, you know, you can see underneath their body, they're not resting their stomach or bellies on the bottom. They are perched on their pelvic fins versus the um, lizard fish, which is clearly just sitting right on the bottom. And that's a kind of a good way to tell them apart. Oh, some gruesome photos here. I, I would say uh, that if you want to see fish eating fish, lizard fish are probably the one between lizard fish and trumpet fish. Those are the two fish that will generally ignore you if you're not if you know as long as you're not splashing around they tend to go back hunting um and so they're they're worth it worth watching on the reef if you if you're into the blood and guts type stuff yeah i mean we've um we've been lucky enough to come across this several times um and again it's you, you can almost like if you see a lizard fish and and there's a lot of small fish nearby and, and you just have you know you just want to you want to see what happens. I mean, it may take a while, but uh, 
But Ethan's right. I mean, if you want to see this kind of gruesome uh, behavior, uh, you know, just general behavior, life on the reef, um, then hanging out with lizard fish is probably your best bet. All right, groupers versus sweet lips. Um, again, this is tricky. Sweet lips and groupers, if they're hovering, tend to, to hover. They, they, swim in, they both swim with their, their tail fins. Now, the good thing is, if you see a robust fish that's sitting on the bottom, it is probably a grouper. There aren't any sweet lips that sit on the bottom. Sweet lips will hover or kind of slowly pace you know, on, in their given home range. Um, so, you know, if it's high, if it's sitting on the bottom and it's kind of the ro this robust, fairly large fish, um, you can go, okay, this is probably a grouper and go right to the grouper section. But there are several groupers that do hover or, you know, kind of patrol a reef like this um, lyre tail wrasse or lyre tail grouper. Um, but sweet lips in general tend to hover. So if you have a decision between these two, it might be a little, little tricky because both have the same type of behavior, swimming behavior, and tend to occupy the same type of, uh, of um, you know, reef space, if you will. They're both found in kind of healthy reef systems. Again, the good thing, the pages, not very many of them, uh, especially sweet lips. You know, there aren't very many. So um, once you get familiar with, with, you know, the more, more common ones, there's only four or five common ones that we see. Um, you know, enough times where you can almost be like, if it's not one of those common ones, it's probably a grouper. Um, but at least initially, you can start by saying, okay, a grouper or sweet lips, you check both pages and you kind of follow it. Both families kind of follow it from there. There's a nice sweet lips, or a nice grouper. There's a nice sweet lips. Now that's kind of interesting actually. Um, so this is the hump head grouper and, you know, our, our logo, of course, is, uh, this guy, cause it's such an awesome looking fish and one that gets everyone excited uh, every time they see it. And this is a sweet lips. Now, interestingly enough, both of them do the same behavior. Both of them as juveniles swim, you know, in a very kind of agitated, you know, non-patterned behavior. And why do they do that? Uh, and it's kind of cool that, you know, you have two different families of fishes um, that both kind of evolved to have the same type of behavior as juveniles. Um, Ethan, I, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there must be something to it uh, in, in regards to that behavior that, that's obviously effective because to us, it looks as if they're calling attention to themselves. I don't believe, uh, you know, the the idea that they're mimicking flatworms. I, I that one, I'm not. I don't. After the thousands of hours that we've put in in the water, that just does not seem like a a theory that uh, that works for me. But so, and and that we know of, they do not have any toxins when they're young. And certainly not when they are adults, um, but I, 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 I'm again. I'm waiting for the essay that one of our guests writes. Um, you know, on that final exam uh, that they each have to take that explains this in a uh, logical way. Right. With, with um, you know, really well thought out published experiment. Um, yeah, you know, to, to prove their case. Oh, multiple. Yeah, you have to have several, you know, reference several uh, studies. But yeah, I'm, I, I still don't know. It's still a mystery. Yeah. All right, squirrel fishes versus soldier fishes. Okay. Um, they tend to be nocturnal. So we don't see a lot of them during the day. But of the ones we see, they're both reddish in color. They both tend to hover. Um, and associate with the reef, um, though if they do swim, they're going to swim with their tail fins. But a good way to tell them apart, squirrel fishes have kind of this sharp snout versus soldier fishes, which is more rounded. So there's even squirrel fishes that look like 
that have the same type of coloration, if you will, as these soldier fishes, but that snout gives them away every time. So that's just something to look out for. If you see something that looks kind of reddish, silvery reddish on the reef, hovering there just above the reef, you're not sure what it is, check the squirrel and soldier fishes. There aren't very many pages, but you can probably start with the squirrel fishes if you saw the snout was you know, pointed as opposed to the soldier fish where it's more rounded. All right, blennies versus gobies. Uh, again, this is, you know, you have um, two fairly smallish fish that sit on the bottom in the same type of habitat. So telling them apart might be tricky at times, but blennies, again, we mentioned in the beginning, they have the Siri. So if you can get close enough, you can tell the difference. If they have Siri, it's a blenny for sure versus a goby that does not possess Siri. If you can't get that close, one of the things you can tell is blennies always curve their tail. They always have, when they're sitting on the bottom, they always tend to curve their tail versus gobies, which stay, you know, you know, you know pretty uniformly straight um, basically the whole time. So that's just another good, good way to tell them apart. You know, blennies and gobies, very specious, a lot of pages, um, you know, might be, might take you, you know, a little bit of time to be able to identify what you saw, but at least you can kind of narrow it down if you can tell if it had Siri versus not, or if their tail was, was curled versus, versus not. Tiddlers, you know, those are the guys we know tiddlers. We've done tiddlers before. Uh, in this case, tiddlers are going to be our little silver sides and they're usually pretty easy to identify. Um, same with scad. They tend to hang in protected areas, uh, sheltered areas and massive schools, you know, tend to only be, you know, a few inches in size. Um, those guys, you know, pretty easy to, to figure out. We've also identified in our last uh, last presentation or the one before, tiddlers. Tiddlers are generally small as fish. So yes, our blennies and gobies would be in the tiddlers class, but we're trying to get uh, a little bit more narrow than that. So we'll accept them as tiddlers, but we'll go from that. Ooh, here's a, yeah, here's a rare tiddler or, you know, one that we don't see a lot. I shouldn't say it's rare, but the, the clingfish, there we go. Yeah, and they, uh, and they are um, uh, closely associated with, um, generally with um, um, sea stars and sea cucumber echinoderms. Yeah. All right, flounders versus soles. All right. Never mind. <laughs> you, you, you're not going to figure out. There's nothing that I found where I'm able to say, okay, this is definitely a characteristic of a flounder versus a sole. You're just not going to find it, unfortunately. So um, the good news, there aren't very many pages. Just go back knowing you found this flattish disc-like fish on the bottom. It's going to be a flounder or a sole and go right to that section. And just just go with it. But trying to separate them out, not going to happen. If you can get a picture of it, figure out which side of its body its eyes are on. There are right eye flounders, left eye flounders, and soles. And each family kind of generally has its eyes on. So this would be like a left eye flounder, this one here, in that family. It's not true between the families. Yeah. So you, yeah. you wouldn't be able to do, do differentiate between souls and flounders that way. Yeah, um, but it can help. But yeah, it is, interesting. It. it is interesting to to get the to know if it's a left eye or right eye uh, flounder um, and getting a picture again. Picture is a huge way. And that's the great thing about digital cameras. I mean, they've done so much for advancing our our own, you know, ability to identify fish because Again, you go out on any snorkel session, you're gonna see a thousand fish and then come back with trying to figure out, you know, a dozen of them. You know, the, you're gonna go crazy trying to remember what you saw, but taking pictures, even if it's a crappy picture, like just ask Ethan, he's taken tons of those 
but you still can use them for identification. They are still hugely important in being able to ID fish. Um, again, you know, just observe what fins were they swimming with and you get a quick picture, that, that's, the, that's the one two knockout punch for getting a, that ID. Nice, that's an awesome shot. All right, now it gets a little crazy because, you know, we just talked about, you know, not using coloration and sure enough, this is another reason why not to use coloration because there are fish that mimic other fish on the reef. So if you went back and you saw, you take the, the fish on the top and you looked and you said, oh, okay, I saw a puffer fish under there. Well, you might have, if all you're going by is what you saw color wise, if all you saw was the you know pretty distinct coloration of the saddle Toby in the upper left, and then went back and said, that's what I saw. Well, you might not have, you might've seen the mimic file fish to the right. The mimic file fish uses kind of classic uh, Batesian mimicry named, named after um, Bates who first described it, where one fish or one organism takes advantage of the warning colors of another organism. So here you have the toby, which are toxic, and the mimic file fish, which is not toxic. But by looking like the toby, it is now afforded the same general sight protection that the toby has earned because fish know that it is toxic. So any fish that has struggled, you know, had dealings with this toby might be like, oh, I don't want anything to do with it. Well, then look at this guy and go, I don't want anything to do with it, even though the mimic file fish is not toxic at all. Now, that only works, of course, if fish first identified with this type of uh, pattern and identifies it as, you know, toxic. But there's an interesting study on reef fish that showed that toxicity was one of the most learned and, and like non-forgettable, if you will, um, a learning, learned behavior that a fish expresses on the reef. In other words, if a fish dealt with something that was toxic and understands warning colors, it will generally stay away from fish that are colorful like this its entire life. Like it won't keep experimenting. It will generally just be like, all right, I'm done with it. And then swim away from any fish that looks like it. So this fish is afforded that type of a protection, even if the fish never encountered this type of fish before, just because it's already been evolved that that type of color pattern usually associated with toxicity, thus stays away from it. So how do we though identify it on the reef? Because we wanna know, did we see this or did we see a cool version, the mimic file fish? Well, they both swim with their pectoral, their, I'm sorry, the dorsal and anal fins. So that's not a good diagnostic. It just gets you into the mimics or it just gets you into the file fish and the puffers. Okay, fair enough. You could thumb through the pages uh, and not make the identification that way. There aren't very many pages, but a really good way, puffer fishes, the pectoral, they're, I keep saying pectoral fin, the dorsal fin and anal fin is really small compared to the mimic file fish or any type of file fish where their um, dorsal and anal fins are really long. And it's very, very obvious. You may say, no way, I'm not gonna see that. But when you're on the reef and you're looking at it, and if you know you're looking at those, those dorsal and anal fins, very obvious, very obvious. And you'll know right away, oh, look how long it is. Must be the mimic versus the, uh, versus the uh, black saddle Toby, the, the model, if you will. All right, we also have down here the wrasse. We have a cleaner wrasse, which performs one of the more important behaviors on the reef, which is to clean other fish and is well protected, not because it's toxic, but because it has a such an important behavior that all fish, predator and, and herbivore, piscivore alike, take advantage of. So this is why you see the um, 
cleaner wrasse swimming in the mouths of groupers, swimming in the mouths of eels, because they're not worried about getting eaten because they're performing an important service that this same fish wants to have performed many times, you know, maybe many times a day, if not many times a week. So it's not going to eat the fish that is performing such an important service. So they are well protected. This guy is the fang blenny, the mimic fang blenny or fang blenny or mimic cleaner wrasse or false cleaner wrasse goes by all those names. These guys do not clean other fish. Rather, they may take advantage of their ability to approach fish and end up taking a bite out of those fish. So fish may swim up to it and go, oh, cleaner wrasse, okay, I'm gonna get clean by it. And they'll come up and take a bite out of it instead of getting clean. And it's like, whoa, I've seen this fit happen before. And the fish, if you know, they ever showed any type of, of behavior, it looks startled. I get looks startled, like what the hell just happened? I thought I was getting clean. Now, more often than not, the um, false cleaner wrasse uses this as a way to protect itself on the reef. Again, nobody is going to go out and eat this guy because he is performing a service. So this guy looking like the model affords him a type of protection. Now, the way to tell them apart, very hard. Um, usually I can tell by behavior alone, um, just because of the way they, they swim and the way they act. Um, but if you can get close enough, wrasses have these tubular type of mouths, which you can kind of see in this picture versus more of an overbite like fang blennies have. So is this one kind of has a pointed snout versus this kind of blunt or tubular snout. And again, these fish are only a few inches in size, not the easiest way to tell them apart. But the good thing is, again, you know it's gonna be one or the other. So you can go right to the cleaner ass and right to the false cleaner ass. And if you have a good picture of it, even a bad picture of it, you might be able to tell the difference. Um, if you see this out on the reef and you're not sure, grab any of us. Um, because like I can tell right away whether it's a, claw, a cleaner ass or a, a false cleaner ass. All right. So yeah, I think I think we're, we're just yeah we're going through just to end uh, the presentation, guys and. and I want to thank Lee for taking the lead on this, considering it was uh, mostly his presentation um, that many of you have seen before. Um, but it's always uh, good to, you know, to go through it and to remind you of those things that help you identify things. And again, mm -hmm. it's not it's not vital that you know the the you know scientific names of every species out there. But we would, you know, it you, you can understand what families are represented in the places we go with exactly the kind of the key that uh, that we was just using and knowing those families anywhere in the world that you you go swim or snorkel you generally hold true at least in you know in tropical areas so it's quite useful and you start learning more about how they how many of these families and many of the genuses and species fit into their overall ecosystem. So we're just gonna run through a few more kind of lesser known species on the way out here. And, uh, but again, uh, before we go, thank you guys for joining, Brian, Lee, myself. Um, again, it's great, great to see many of your names uh, and I really enjoy kind of hanging out with you guys again. We'll do this again in a couple weeks um, and we'll come up with a, another cool presentation for you guys uh, at that point but so just kind of keep your eye out there for for another announcement soon um ah my favorite right there sexy little fish mm. so what is this guy the hard stone fish no no reef that's that's so that's just the reef scorpions uh sinantia varicosa uh reef stone I, I wish I had skin like that.
So a um, C moth. Pipe that, fish. That was from Ambon or Elvor. Yeah. Again, our, our snorkeling, when we snorkel, pipe fish all day, every day, but divers, very rare. Because we're, we're in the pipe fish habitat a lot. Oh, I remember this day like yesterday. This was in Spooky, <laughs> Raja. Yeah. Oh, what a treat. Spooky what gem. a treat. So, Halamita ghost pipefish, uh, one of the more sought after of all the species of fish, uh, tropical fish in the ocean. And uh, we got lucky to see uh, a pair of them. And in about a foot and a half of water. And that's what I love about snorkeling. Uh, and that's what I love about, you know, seeing this type of stuff because all the divers they're like yeah we see this you guys don't get to see anything no we see it all because we understand habitat we understand where these fish fish hide it's the divers aren't up there so they think because they're not there these guys must not be there because they only see them down at 60 feet well not true not true Mm. Now, we've had a couple chances to see these guys as snorkelers. I mean, I'm just coming off bragging about how much we get to see uh, rare fish in the shallows just as much as divers do in the, in the depths. Um, we've only had a few chances, both in, in Al Aljui Bay, um, to see the uh, pygmy seahorse. But admittedly, the divers have an advantage for this guy only because they can stay down there long enough to seek these guys out because they're only about a half a centimeter big. So you have to be able to stay down there long enough to be able to, to see it um, or have amazing eyes like the guys on Mermaid, Nico, uh, that just are, are so conditioned to being able to spot these guys that they can go down there on a, a good breath of air and, and, and see them, amazing. So I, I put this special. one in, this is uh, uh, because we haven't seen it. We have not seen this yet, but undoubtedly we have swum over it. It does exist, uh, you know, throughout Indonesia and up into the Philippines. This is the pygmy pipe horse. Um, uh, some people call it the, the lembe dragon horse or something like that. But uh, it's very, it looks like dirty dental floss but kind of uh, hangs out with Gorgonians or uh, Hydroids. Um, so again, it's one of these very bizarre kind of crosses between a seahorse and a pipefish. Um, and again, it just, to me, it's a marvel of, of natural selection and evolution, uh, creating something like this, a, a vertebrate like this that, that we get to, to see occasionally. So, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll be hunting for this in the fall. Okay, I think I think that's it, guys. So again, uh, I want to thank Lee, Brian. Thank you uh, for joining us. Everybody who is still with us, um, man, I miss you guys, and uh, I cannot wait to get back in the water. Uh, Lee and I talk on a weekly basis, uh, you know, about what's going on and how best to um, kind of, you know, how you know, in the most safe manner. Uh, we want to get back out there, and I think it's just we're going to have to, you know, time will tell. But for sure, come the fall, we are in the water. I'm sure, you know, most of the planet will be vaccinated by then. And so travel restrictions and, and uh, procedures and, you know, logistical stuff should be a lot easier by then. So, again, thank you guys. Uh, from my perspective, uh, Brian and Lee, you guys want to say yeah. something before we take off? As usual. It's great yeah. seeing everyone. And uh, look for an email. We'll, we'll come up with something, uh, again, really interesting for next week or in two weeks. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to update everyone with some, you know, even more positive news about uh, when we'll be able to, to get back in the water. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right, guys. Again, see everybody in a couple of weeks.
All right, Ethan, set another one up. Okay. You got it. <laughs>